Good afternoon. If I could bring you back to some semblance of order <laughs> after our lunchtime presentations. It's now uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Chow. Ann, uh, Dr. Chow is from Rice University where she is an adjunct lecturer in the humanities and an advisory board member at the School of Humanities. And Dr. Chow will be talking about Unit 731, Japanese Experiments and Trials. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this kind invitation. Thank you for the Kennedy Institute and the Pellegrino Center for inviting me. Um, I'm, this is my first introduction to this wonderful community of scholars, experts on medical ethics, a Nuremberg trial, the Holocaust. And what I can offer is a broad overview of what was happening in East Asia at the same time. Um, can I have the PowerPoint, please? So perhaps before, oh, oh here we go. Okay, so a little context, a background on what was happening. In Japan, um, at, until the 19th century, looked up to China as a source of cultural, religious, and philosophical foundation. But toward the 19th century, as China was falling apart, Japan actually underwent a modernization period during the Meiji Restoration. They sent out important people, intellectuals, politicians across the world for two years, studied constitutions, studied different governmental systems, came back to Japan, and basically modernized the country. They had a strong navy, they had strong government, or rather a strong community of scholars who were able to discuss different ideas, and Japan basically transformed itself from an agrarian society into a modern state in a very, very short time. Um, and then at the same time, though, within the society, there was a huge amount of disorder, disarray. There were about 200 political parties. Women were given unprecedented uh, positions and freedom. And as a result, it led to a governmental crackdown. In 1890, there was a rescript on education, where education curriculum became controlled by the state. There was another rescript on soldiers and uh, and sailors that basically removed the military, the educational professional, journalists and women from engaging in politics. And finally, in 1925, the peace preservation law gave more power to the government to impose censorship. Against that drop backdrop, there was also an economic downturn in depression 1920s, and then the turmoil in the society led the military to try to take control. So they created this um, myth that the emperor was basically held prisoner by the Zaibatsu, which were the commercial leaders of Japan, and by the politicians. So the military took upon itself to start assassinating prime ministers, politicians, and important business leaders. And they, they had a, uh, um, a slogan called Sono Joy, which meant expel the barbarians, restore the emperor. At the same time, they attempted to create something that they have emulated in the West to create a greater Eastern co-prosperity sphere, which is basically um, control over the, the Micronesian islands, and they were trying to um, expand their reach into the southeast part of Asia. Manchuria was a very rich state. Um, Manchuria was actually nominally part of China, but China had very little control over that part of the country. It was rich in minerals. The Russian took over and created a huge, vast system of railroad networks. And it was rich in coal and mineral and all the other good resources. And so the, the land mass is about as big as the combined size of France and Germany. In 1908, there were about 17 million people, but by 1930, there were 30 million people, and many of them were Japanese immigrants. The Japanese government had always worried about overcrowded conditions in Japan, so they moved poor Japanese soldiers and all kinds of different people into Manchuria and started doing experimentation, which we will hear very soon. Um, Japan also engaged in two, and I go back a little bit in that sense, Japan had engaged in two wars at the turn of the 19th century. In 1894 and 1895, they fought against China, and against all expectations, they won very handily against China. And that basically allowed them into more control into Manchuria and into Korea. Then in 1904 and 1905, Japan fought Russia and won against Russia. That um, earned the attention of the Western powers, so Washington and London basically invited Japan to come to naval conferences regarded Japan as a naval ally in the Pacific Ocean and basically welcomed Japan into this club of imperialist power. 
And as a result, um, Japanese ambition grew, and Manchuria was very much something they wanted to control. So in, um, they basically blew up um, the railway in 1931 in Manchuria and nominally overran Manchuria. They installed the last emperor of China, who was basically um, expelled from the Forbidden City when the China became a republic in 1911, and installed him as the puppet emperor of this Manchurian state. Um, at the same time, they really wanted to control more, even more than Manchuria, and then in 1937, they blew up a bridge that connected Manchuria to the inner part of China and basically started the invasion of China. China at the time was in total disarray. Chiang Kai-shek, who you can see, I don't know if there's a pointer, but anyway, Chiang Kai-shek is the person to the second to the right. He was nominally in control of China, but actually China was really uh, torn apart by warlords and by the incipient Communist Party. So Chiang Kai-shek had his hands tied in trying to unify China and basically ignore the Japanese invasion. So as the Japan Japanese increasingly came into Shanghai, into inner China, Chiang Kai-shek retreated, and that caused millions of lives of Chinese and lost his um, um, reputation among the Chinese. So after World War II, the people were so bitter against what Chiang Kai-shek did, they really did not have the ability to regain all the political control that he needed to, um, to stay on the mainland. And so Jap Japanese basically overran um, Manchuria in 1931, and they overran China, or slowly moved into China in 1937. So back into Manchuria. The Japanese sent lots of scientists and lots of poor farmers and other people to Manchuria. And one of the men that they sent was this uh, Major Ishii Shiro on your left. He was actually a highly educated doctor. He was a graduate of Kyoto University Medical School, excellent student trained in bacteriology, serology, pathology, and preventive medicine. He also has a PhD in microbiology. His work at eradicating an outbreak of the Japanese bee variety encephalitis by water filtration, water filtration system boosted his career and earned the attention of his superiors. He joined the army, associated with the ultra-nationalist group of Japanese soldiers, and talked about the advantages of using biological warfare. He became a professor of immunology at the Tokyo Army Medical School and held the rank of major in the army. He began doing biological warfare research in the medical school, and in 1932, he toured Manchuria and stayed there. In Japan, the medical students were not administered the Hippocratic Oath. It was expected that they will behave ethically. Ishii was supported by his medical school superiors, by the upper echelon of the Kwantan Army, what, that is the name of the army uh, in Manchuria, and, he was, and the army was dominated by ultra-nationalists. So the first lab he created was in northern uh, Manchuria. It's, a, it's called Beiyinghe, and it lasted for five years. It was basically a large prison complex, and the victims there were prisoners of war, um, and they were not regarded as human beings. They were called meruta, a Japanese term for logs. And the, the uh, prison compound had walls three meters tall, 100 big buildings, and there are two wings. One contained a testing ground, the laboratories, uh, the crematoriums, and munition and dump. The other was the offices and the residential quarters of the, soldier, of the uh, soldiers and the scientists. And they tested three types of contagions on the prisoners, anthrax, glenders, and plagues. They injected virus into prisoners. And when the prisoners were unconscious, they dissected the prisoners. And they also used poison gas and cholera virus and tested them on the prisoners. In 1937, prisoners escaped, so Ishii quickly closed the camp and killed all the prisoners. So then the, the largest complex um, that Unit 731 is known for is called Pingfang. And there, um, inmates were, as you can see, all different types of people, and the size rivaled that of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, it was guarded with maximum security, 76 structures, 150 so or so buildings, and the buildings consisted of offices, laboratories, dormitories, barracks, arms magazine, barns for testing animals, stables, uh, autopsy dissecting buildings, lab for frostbite experiments, farm for fruits, vegetables for the staff, greenhouses for plants, prison, power plant. There were three furnaces to dispose of human and animal corpses, recreational facilities, including brothels staffed with comfort women, 
And the dorms were also state-of-the-art facilities containing an, an auditorium, a library, a bar, garden, swimming pool, and restaurants. They had their own medical clinic, a Shinto temple. Shinto is a Japanese religion, and a school to educate children of the soldiers and physicians. Ishii commanded a small army, a fleet of planes, and he knew how to fly, fly airplanes, bombs of varying types and landing strips, an initial budget with three million for personnel, six million for experimentation research, which was a huge budget, and that clearly indicates how much confidence his superiors had in him. His workers were scientists and physicians from Japanese universities. Some came to advance their careers, some came by order. There were about 5,000 workers, of which 10% were physicians. So they conducted human experimentation in Pingfang. The defensive unit of biological warfare worked on vaccines, and the offensive unit of biological warfare worked on organisms that cause diseases. And as you can see, the kind of diseases that they were testing on these um, POWs. Um, and to the question that we already talked about, why did this highly educated physician do what they did? They were patriotic. They thought they were helping Japan advance its cause. Um, the, and they believed the emperor had ordered all this happening, and they wanted to obey the emperor. Um, they wanted to find out knowledge, scientific knowledge. Um, and then beside these subjects were not human. They were marutas, and therefore it's OK to perform experiments on them. And then also many of them were threatened with career negative outcomes if they refused these jobs. Um, and so as a result, many of these were carried out by some of the best educated physicians in Japan. So some of these experiments, um, well, these prisoners were basically dragged from their prison cells to underground testing facilities. They were injected with pathogens or fed food laced with pathogens. So chocolates, cookies, liquids, vegetables, and fruits were all spiked with pathogens. Um, they were hung upside down to determine length of time to choke to death. They were injected with air to determine onset of embolism. Um, so some of the people received porridge with one gram of heroin in it, and then the scientists observed how long it took them to die. There were typhoid experiments where naked prisoners were exposed to a bomb containing buckshots mixed with typhoid germs, exploding one meter from the rear of the victims. And if the victims did not die of experiment, they were killed afterwards. Most were dissected, and all were cremated. Thousands died in experiments. Tens of thousands were annihilated when the Japanese retreated. And still later, tens of thousands died as a result of the plague epidemics in later years, as the soil contained res residual pathogens. And two million pieces of chemical weapons were found buried in northeast China. The published papers that these scientists created mentioned that the results were obtained from monkeys. And so the Chinese um, had calculated that the Japanese probably used chemical warfare in 2,000 battles on the, in China. And in some instances, biological warfare were deployed by the Japanese. There was an instance when anthrax was disseminated via bullets coated with anthrax pathogens. Another instance where wheat grains coated with plague pathogens were dropped from airplanes. Typhoid and paratyphoid pathogens were injected into dumplings and were fed to Chinese dumplings of prisoners of war before they were released. And finally, fleas infected with plague pathogens were released in the city northeast China. So when the war was over, um, Ishii destroyed all evidence of what, he's, of what the whole team has done, um, especially the biological warfare. He mentioned that he has finished off 404 Marutas, he shipped crates of files back to Japan, hid them, and tried to float a rumor that he had died. Now, unlike the Nuremberg trial, where there was an international military tribunal, in, in this case, General Douglas MacArthur, um, the supreme commander of the Allied powers, basically proclaimed the charter of the tribunal. The appointment of the US prosecutor, Joseph Keenan, the picture of, uh, in the middle of the, of the screen, um, as chief counsel, and the other allied prosecutors, Australians and other nationalities, were considered associates. That reinforced the heavy-handed influence of the US. The US State War Navy Coordinating Committee, SWNCC, which is a precursor to today's National Security Council, decided who to exclude from the trial. So no member of the commercial elite, the Zaibatsu, 
such as the head of Mitsubishi, that is a Mitsubishi insignia, the red triangle, and Japan's bacteriological and chemical warfare programs, none of these people were included in the trials. And this trial was extremely rigged in the sense that the defendants were denied the right to counsel. They were interrogated without the presence of counsel, and those materials were included in the prosecution. Um, the Tokyo Tribunal changed the rules from day to day to the detriment of the defense. And so as a result, it was an extremely rigged um, trial. And even more damaging is that because the US prosecutors, interrogators relied, relied on Japanese uh, translators, um, the translators who were serving in that role basically coached the prisoners of war what to say. So um, Lieutenant, Colonel, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Murray Sanders, whose picture you see, was the first um, interrogate, principal investigator. He relied on a Japanese Lieutenant Colonel Nizuma Seichi to be the translator, and basically um, Seichi led him to believe that biological warfare was a very minimal uh, experiment, and then it was conducted by some rogue military officers and the Japanese civilians were not involved. In fact, um, this person, Seiichi, controlled all the technical research work for the Japanese army. And he coached the chief of the division of preventive medicine, the chief of the bacteriological section of the Tokyo Army Medical College, and the army surgeon to say that none of them knew anything about the biological warfare that were uh, being studied and conducted. And Sanders, on his part, explained to these prisoners of war, uh, criminal, war criminals, that he really wanted the scientific information, and he was not really interested in their war crimes. And then later he had a second interpreter, Dr. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Naito Ryochi, who sat in also on many of these interviews and basically led and shaped the questions that Sanders posed, posed to these um, people. And so he gave Sanders selective information. And Sanders, it was not until 1983 that Murray Sanders realized how much he was misled by this second interpreter. Sanders eventually took ill, and a second investigator came in and was conducted by Dr. Lieutenant Colonel Avril Thompson in 1946. Thompson was very familiar with biological warfare and realized that there was extensive work being conducted. Um, eventually, with more Russian sources, they pieced together that was a tremendous work going on, and that not only the military, but the medical community, the diet, which is their parliament, the royal family, all knew of these experiments, and therefore it was very unlikely that the emperor would have no knowledge of any of this. But unlike, uh, unknown to all of these military interrogators, uh, Ishii, the head of our Unit 731, was engaged in secret negotiation with the American intelligence officers where he would agree to hand over all of the medical data in exchange for not being persecuted. And finally, when a third investigator came in and realized that the Japanese were as guilty as they ex um, expected, um, they agreed that it's probably not a good idea to try them because it was much cheaper to let them go and then obtain all the medical information. And here is this famous quote that it's about an outlay of 2,220 US dollars um, to get all of the information. So as a result, because these um, scientists were never persecuted, after the war, they had a very successful, many of them had very successful careers. And my little circle will show you that there, were, um, there was a prime minister of Japan. In fact, the prime minister of Japan is the grandfather to the prime minister Shinzo Abe, who was recently assassinated in Japan. He was a um, war criminal who was released and then became prime minister. There were uh, medical, there were um, students of, I can't read too well, but I think in Cedar Dean's a medical school, there's, a, there's something called Green Cross, which is similar to Red Cross in Japan that's highly, regard, highly prestigious and it's a, a blood bank. Well, the founders of the Green Cross were actually alums of Unit 731. And the, I think the founders tried to hide his past, but finally, maybe, I don't know how many years ago, 10, 20 years ago, it was found out his background and he was basically let go. But many other people in that company were all alums of Unit 731. And I think the fact that they were not punished explained the quick um, advances in scientific research that Japan experienced and enjoyed after World War II. So the question is, can we use this data? And I think we already had many extensive discussions today and yesterday um, about should we just completely ignore them in the sense of non-use, selectively use them, conditional use, or just use all of them because we think they'll save lives. And that's a debate 
to be continued still. Uh, many of the data they handed over to Americans were actually useless because some of them had already been tested and the results were known. But there were three groups of things that seemed to be of some medical use. One was the TB vaccination experiments when they injected healthy POWs with TB germs and observed their dying. Um, the other is mustard gas experiments. The result um, could not be replicated in a humane way in any other American, I hope, or used Western uh, medical labs and that seemed to be important. And then a frostbite experiment where prisoners were forced to stand motionless in minus 30 degree weather and then have some parts of the body exposed. Even a three-year-old baby was used to see the time of death. So this is a debate that continues. During the war and after the war, there were people who were very, very upset and against the whole thing, but they were afraid to speak up. Even the brother of the of the emperor. Um, the picture on the left is Prince Mikasa. He said that um, he was really, uh, even today, I constantly feel the sting of conscience over my failure to fully grasp the criminality of the war. He wrote, spoke against it, assailed the military, but his speeches were destroyed by the military. He was censured, and finally, his speeches it resurfaced only not uh, recently. Um, the person on your right, on the top right, he was actually a soldier. Uh, during the massacre of Nanjing. Nanjing is a city in China when the uh, Japanese advanced from Shanghai to Nanjing. Um, in 1939, I think, they killed millions and millions of uh, civilians. And so this guy, uh, this person, Shiro Azuma, reflected that there was a woman holding a child on her right arm and another one on her left. We stabbed and killed them, all three, like potatoes on a skewer. I thought then it's only been one month since I left home, and 30 days later, here I was, killing people without remorse. Um, he wrote about this afterwards, and then he was sued by his commanding officer for libel, and he lost the case. Um, a, a histor and then um, one soldier reflected that when I saw the blackened face of the Maruta, of his blood was completely drained. I wonder how someone could do such a thing to him. What had the Maruta done to, to deserve these atrocities? I wanted to treat them like human beings. And this was a soldier who clearly had a, about a conscience after the war. Um, eventually, several doctors did commit suicide after the war. Some doctors refused to go into prestigious medical institutions, spent their careers as country doctors and a way of atonement. Um, the historian, whose picture is in the middle, since 1965, he brought a series of lawsuits against the Japanese Ministry of Education because they forced him to remove evidence of the Nanjing Massacre and of Unit 731 from his textbooks, and was finally partially vindicated in 1997. And in 2018, um, a professor in a university uh, of medical science published the names of the 3,607 people who worked in Unit 731. But to this day, the Japanese government has not officially apologized for the war. They've done certain partial apologies for inflicting pain on their neighbors, um, neighboring countries. They have provided a certain amount of money, compensation for the comfort women, but the money was funded through an independent nonprofit so that it doesn't look like it came directly from the Japanese government. So this lack of contrition has caused huge amount of antagonism between Japan and China and Korea. So these atrocities clearly were not limited to World War II or for Japan. What is happening in China today rivals the cruelty and the inhumanity of what, has, what we've discussed. And Xinjiang, as many of you know, on the western part of China, its official name is the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, XUAR. It is actually a huge piece of land. It occupies one-sixth of China. There are 26 million people there, 11 million of which are Uyghurs. Um, One million currently are in prison in these re-education camps. The area, again like Manchuria, is very rich in coal, gas, oil, lithium, zinc, and lead, as well as it is located in the, um, and it also has a huge amount of agriculture product to supply the rest of the country. It also shares external borders with other countries such as Afghanistan, India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, Pakistan, the Russian Federation, and Tajikistan. And it lies in the middle of this crucial belt, one belt and one uh, road, um, project that China is trying to create to take Chinese influence across Central Asia. As a result, China really wanted to secure that piece of the state, I mean, a huge piece of the country, and it is now has a huge population. In 1953, 
there were 73% Uyghurs. Today, there's 45% Uyghurs, and the other 42% are Han. Han is a major ethnic group of Chinese, and they were clearly allowed to migrate into Xinjiang, populate Xinjiang eventually to eradicate the Uyghur culture. Um, and so in 2009, there was a unrest in Urumqi, which is the capital of, Tibet, of Xinjiang, and it gave the Chinese government an excuse to move into Xinjiang and to claim that everything they're doing is for state security and they're to prevent terrorism. And then the, in 2017, the anti-extremism law was a pass which allows arbitrary detention, that if you grew a beer, you were thrown into re-education camp. If you were bailed, you will be also thrown into jail. Um, Uyghurs were subject to intense surveillance, religious restrictions, forced labor, forced sterilization, and torture. The US, Canada, and UK governments have declared what China is doing is tantamount to genocide, and the UN has declared that China has committed crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. So this is um, a very brief overview of what happened in the World War II in Asia and what is happening today. Um, it is extremely depressing, and I'm sorry that we cannot end on a happier note. Um, I did have this poem, which my son, my son thought was very hokey to attack onto the end of this presentation, but I think that we have no voices from Unit 731. Unlike in Germany, you have survivors. These people are all killed. And I'm thinking this is a way to present a voice for the future. Um, and I think this shows that evil does not ri rise, uh, reside only in Germany or in Japan. It is something, a part of the human condition. And that's why I think this conference is extremely important. So thank you very much. One question. W w were there any codes of ethics in, in Asia? Was there a code of ethics in Asia before the Nuremberg Code that we're discussing that you think these physicians should have been practicing under? If you're, if you're talking about just medical ethics, I don't think so. But in terms of um, philosophical um, Tenets, you know, the, the Asians are Confucian, they're Buddhist, you know, they're Muslim, they all speak to kindness, compassion, and clearly this does not translate in, in war crimes or in, in, in war times. Yes. Uh, yes, so my question is about the um, whether, I mean, this, there, there's a mixture of political and, and medical ethics here, of course, but I'm wondering about the, if you have any information about the, um, the role or whether there are any like, discussions within the medical communities in Japan about um, you know, even discussing these issues or, or taking some kind of a responsibility, or is it so heavily politicized and historicized that, they th that there is no debate? Are you talking about during the war or post-war? No, now. Now, for example, yes. I'm sorry? Uh, no, much more recently, after oh, the war. Let's yeah. say end of the 20th yeah. century and now. I think right now there is, but right after the war there wasn't. And then I think the whole thing is very political. Um, for instance, there is some, there's a shrine in Japan that commemorates the heroes, if you will, if you're looking from Japanese point of view, of the war. And it's been a huge bone of contention between the international community and the Japanese leadership to see whether or not a prime minister who's recently elected, uh, who, who just got elected, would go to the shrine and pay respect. Um, if the prime minister did pay respect to the shrine, it signaled to the international community that they were not remorseful about the war, because what the international community considers war criminals were heroes for them. So I think there was only one prime minister who refused to go to, I think it's called the Yakusumi Shrine, but all of the, including in Shinto Abe, they all went to the shrine and paid respect. So that is the direction from the top, that they do not recognize what they did was wrong. Um, the other uh, consideration is that Western powers were aggressors in many t situations in, you know, in different uh, wars. So Japan basically said, well, we're just copying what the other imperialist powers are doing. We are just invading. We're not invading. We're taking over these poor people and we're actually importing civilization and better lifestyle to them. So why are we in the wrong? Um, so the, the people there are, as I mentioned, there were some people who objected, but they were very afraid 
for their own future, and they dare not really voice their opposition. Um, I think over time, there is more of an uh, indication that they did something wrong. But as we saw in these lawsuits and the professors who are trying to uh, speak the truth, um, it is still not a popular attitude. For instance, I think the historical textbooks in Japan still pretty much lightly touch on the Nanji massacre and on what they did to China. Yes. Um, do you have any information on experimentation on American prisoners yes. before? Yeah, there were some, and I was looking it up. Um, they were not necessarily put into Unit 731 uh, because America joined war later, right? And then basically they were in the Pacific War Theater. So I read that there were some American soldiers who were captured in the Carolina Islands who were subject to medical experimentation. But it wasn't a lot because, and then, you know, they were basically in the, on the islands. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm trying to put together um, your presentation with what we heard this morning. And um, I'm trying to draw potential analogies, which obviously entails always that there are some dimensions or similarities, but also differences. If I understand correctly, one could say that in the German case, we had an entire profession that was hijacked by a particular political power and went along with a particular political power, uh, driven by, of course, a racist and genocidal ideology. In the case of Japan, it looks like, on the other hand, the initiative, if I understood correctly, comes from physicians themselves. I mean, you mentioned the fact that the emperor knew about this, but could we really create the same or establish the same kind of uh, connection with what happened in Germany? Or isn't there a real difference here with respect to uh, the way in which the physician turns scientist at some point decides that uh, there is a particular scientific goal to pursue, if not independently of the political um, government, uh, somewhat uh, independently of it, or, or am I mistaken? So. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. What I forgot to mention is that Japanese are very proud of their racial purity, similarly in a way to the Nazi ideology, because they claim to be their emperor is in an uninterrupted line of descent from the first emperor who is a descendant of the sun. And so as a result, um, they regarded non-Japanese as less important or you know, as subhumans, and therefore there's that purity that also want, we, they want to maintain, almost like the Aryan race ideology. That's one. We read accounts where some doctors who were sent to Manchuria really fought and really had problems with their conscience about working on the experiments that they did. Very few brave ones would quit, but then your future is extremely bleak. Many basically said, well, I can't help it, I really don't want to do this, but then I need a job, and if I don't do it, my career, not only my career suffer, but my family will suffer. As a result, they did it. And I think there are people who are really interested in the results of scientific experiment. Um, so the medical community did cooperate with the military, but given the turmoil within Japan at the time, um, we know that the military, for instance, when they overran Manchuria and then invaded China, they took the initiative before the parliament or the prime minister approved of their actions. And the military had the upper hand at the time because it floated the myth that the emperor was imprisoned or captivated by this group of inept um, politicians and businessmen, and therefore they took upon themselves to do a lot of these um, horrendous acts. But once they've captured China, the Chinese, Japanese government fell into place. Oh, great. Now we've got this bigger piece of land to, to, uh, to do things with. And then there was less and less dissent. And even the brother of the emperor did not dare his, voice his concerns. So you can tell how much pressure there was to conform. So I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Did the Japanese ever develop a Nuremberg Code of sorts to deal with medical experiments, human subject research after the war? I'm sorry, I did not research that, but I need to look it up. I would be surprised if they didn't. 
but um, I just don't know right now. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Chow. All I can, I don't know if people know that movie, um, Night in Fog, Nuit et Brume. All, all I can think of through today is uh, the end of that film where you see the ceiling of the gas chamber in one of the concentration camps, which was concrete, and you can see people had tried to claw it. And the last line of the film is about these things will happen again as long as people are deaf to the endless cry. I mean, it, today has just been a day of hearing that endless cry. Um, it's my happier task now <laughs> to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dan Salmezi is a friend who I've known for many years. Um, Dan is one of the reasons I came to Georgetown three years ago, and most of the time I'm really happy about that. Um, <clears throat> Dan is the director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. He's the Andre Helliger's Professor of Biomedical Ethics in the Departments of Medicine and Philosophy, and he's also a member of the faculty of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. As I think you know, Dan is one of the leaders in medical ethics in the United States, if not the world, a prolific scholar, a practicing physician and a very nice man. So Dan. <laughs> uh, thanks, Miles, for that uh, very gracious uh, introduction. Um, are my slides uh, uh, coming up uh, here? Um, That'd be uh, that'd be terrific if they uh, if they could. I've also been um, obviously Im impressed by the uh, conversation that we've had thus far uh, today, I've uh, certainly learned um, an, uh, an awful lot. Um, and um, uh, it's my task now to try to um, bring this to, uh, um, uh, to a close. I will um, remind everybody again that uh, all of the program is going to be uh, recorded. It'll be available uh, on the website um, next, uh, by hopefully next week, um, on the Kennedy Institute of Ethics uh, website, um, uh, particularly during the uh, lunch period for those who are here live. Um, if we, um, uh, if you uh, went to one session and want to hear the other, you can uh, you can do that, um, and um, and vice uh, and vice versa. Um, this is um, my attempt to sort of try to um, uh, make us uh, more aware of the connections between some of the history we've uh, heard today and some medical uh, issues uh, uh, today. Um, much in the spirit of Professor Windling talking about the connection between um, um, history and, uh, and medical ethics. Um, let me start by um, saying what I think many have already uh, said here, uh, that um, the, the Holocaust um, in many ways is sui generis, uh, right? There's not going to be uh, an exact uh, repetition of those horrific circumstances anywhere. Um, it was a combination, um, as I think many of you will agree with me, of sort of um, centuries-old uh, anti-Semitism um, with uh, what we've heard um, from some of the speakers already, um, a, an ideology that um, in some ways saw um, uh, politics as applied biology. Um, the marriage between uh, the, the kind of uh, eugenic gen, uh, and uh, uh, and geneticized uh, approach to medicine that uh, was common among um, physicians around the world, but particularly Germans, um, with uh, the ideology of Adolf uh, Hitler, um, that um, ultimately led to unspeakable um, horrors um, that are, in fact, um, uh, you know, in themselves, um, totally unrepeatable. Um, uh, but. There are some mistakes we can make, I think, in reflecting uh, that way. One of them um, is to deceive ourselves into thinking, quote, um, something like this won't ever uh, happen again. Um, we saw in some ways that it happened in parallel um, at the same time in Japan, just from the uh, uh, talk that, uh, that, we, uh, that we heard with many similar um, characteristics. Um, um, and so um, uh, I, I think that we have to be very careful about um, thinking that these 
uh, uh, events were so horrific uh, that nothing like them could ever be um, uh, experienced again. Um, the second danger, which I think is the most common one, um, is that everything that we've heard seems so horrific um, that we can very easily distance ourselves from it, right? Um, you know, I'm, I would um, have never heard anybody saying that they are going to um, put somebody into ice cold water to see how, they, um, uh, how long it takes them to die, right? Um, that sort of thing just doesn't happen um, in, the, um, in the 21st century, at least in the, in the West. And so we think that this is so horrible that um, it's so distant from us that it is nothing to do with us. Um, um, uh, but I think that's um, also a mistake, um, because I think there are things that we can learn um, um, from this, uh, this history. And to distance ourselves so much doesn't allow us the opportunity to be as reflective as we ought to be. Um, Another mistake um, that happens often is hijacking um, the Holocaust or Holocaust medicine um, for political purposes, right, left, center, doesn't matter. Um, um, I think that that um, is uh, something that we should avoid. Um, in some ways, I think we ought to avoid thinking analogically at all. Um, ab about this. I mean, that's always the temptation is to sort of say, uh, th this is like this, this is not like that, um, and to make these comparisons with something that really um, 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 is um, um, maybe a mistake to, um, to even begin to think um, in analogical terms about um, what happens today, what happens tomorrow, um, to, what, um, uh, to what happened then. Um, um, and um, uh, I think the, um, the, the last is uh, totally avoiding, because of that, um, any attempt to learn anything from it and just sort of say, um, we can't speak about contemporary medical ethics um, and anything that happened during the Holocaust um, because um, it uh, leads inevitably to too many questions and too many, uh, too many problems. Rather, and I think um, uh, Roberto's uh, qu uh, question last night um, got something at where I think we um, can be more f uh, fruitful in our uh, thinking, is what sorts of trends are there, what sorts of ideas are there, uh, what sorts of attitudes are there um, in culture, um, in the scientific attitude um, that is part of medicine and the practice of medicine and medical science universally um, that um, um, uh, have, in fact, um, if taken to a logical extreme, uh, the possibility of leading in the directions that they did um, in the middle of the last, uh, last century. Um, um, what makes us potentially susceptible to thinking that even moves in a slight direction um, uh, toward that? Um, and, and to cultivate within ourselves then um, really a sense of vigilance, um, recognizing um, that something like this could happen again um, if we are not careful. And to do that, I thought I'd talk about just five um, areas of uh, bioethics and sort of compare uh, a then and, and now um, on all of these. Um, um, one is informed consent. Um, one is research ethics. Uh, one is population health. Uh, one is eugenics. Um, and one is euthanasia. And again, I'm. Uh, this is a broad overview. I'm obviously not going to solve any of these questions, but I want to um, try to set up um, the structure for reflecting um, on what happened then and what's happening now in ways that, uh, we, that might be instructive for us. So if we think about the question of informed consent, which has come up in um, a, a number of the talks, um, um, it is not as if um, this was something that was totally unknown in the middle of the 20th um, century. Um, um, it was true that there was no absolute international doctrine of informed consent prior to the Nuremberg uh, trial and the promulgation of the Nuremberg um, uh, Declaration, um, and maybe it was something uh, that Ivy was looking uh, to try to do, um, but it wasn't as if Ivy made up the idea of informed consent or it hadn't already been um, thought of in other um, um, parts of, uh, of history prior um, to the Second World War. 
um, Albert Neiser, I'll tell you about from uh, Prussia, um, um, Osler, um, and the uh, uh, and even in the United States, the Schlondorf decision um, all preceded um, the uh, um, uh, the Nuremberg um, trials or the Nazi uh, 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 medical experiments. Neiser, um, um, here's a, a picture of him, um, was a, a famous Prussian infectious disease uh, specialist um, who actually at the um, end of the, uh, uh, the 19th century um, was experimenting by injecting um, without consent um, the blood of, uh, of, of uh, prostitutes who were infected with uh, syphilis um, into um, um, other prostitutes um, to study a serum treatment for the disease. Um, there were no explanations, no alternatives, no choices, and it was recognized then that there was something wrong with this. Um, and um, he was prosecuted in 1898, and um, Prussia um, issued a directive requiring informed consent, which was the predecessor then um, to what we heard about in the uh, Weimar Republic of the 1931 guidelines um, from, uh, from all of uh, Germany for, um, uh, for medical research. Um, Osler, um, in 1898, also uh, got criticized, and this is from Cushing's Life of Osler, um, uh, um, the experiments from somebody named Santarelli, who um, uh, were in saying that they were ridiculous, um, 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 and that even granting uh, that every dose of medicine we give is an experiment to deliberately utilize a human being for the purpose of, of research, uh, without the sanction of the individual, is not ridiculous, it is criminal. Um, that's 1898. And then, of course, in the United States, uh, we have um, the beginnings of, uh, of um, informed consent doctrine for um, clinical medicine with Cardozo's um, a famous um, decision uh, uh, in um, Schlondorf versus the Society of New York Hospital that every human being of adult years and sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done with his own body and a surgeon who performs an operation without his patient's consent commits an assault for which he is liable um, in damages. Um, notwithstanding the fact that the patient was a she, not a he, um, uh, um, this was a pretty strong statement of um, informed consent. So the idea was not um, something that was unknown um, to the world or to the world of medicine. Um, but obviously, um, obviously there was no um, informed consent at Sachsenhausen, Dachau, Auschwitz, um, any of the other uh, concentration camps where experiments uh, uh, took place. Um, and as we've heard before, uh, the Nuremberg Code then said the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely uh, essential. Um, as a reaction, perhaps, to that, to try to make it, um, in Ivy's view, something that was more uh, universally recognized, even though the idea was certainly um, uh, around way before that. But as you may have heard from some of our previous discussions, it's not as if um, having had the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, Nuremberg uh, a code that everything is hunky-dory in terms of uh, informed consent. Um, we have issues now not only about um, uh, learning healthcare systems, just about what happens in general um, to electronic medical records and research that's conducted on those and whether those uh, data can be sold. Uh, informed consent for tissue sample use, whether um, persons can give consent for any use of these or whether they have to be contacted each time a research project is used, um, genetic databases and what kind of research can happen with those, emergency treatment research, again we heard a little bit about that, presumed consent for organ donation, which happens in some nations um, and not happened in the United States, which is the right way to go. Um, can we perform research on subjects with diminished uh, decisional capacity? Can a proxy consent for someone? Can we, can, how much research risk can parents um, allow um, a child to undertake? Um, and whether um, um, uh, we can do research in vulnerable uh, populations, such as prisoners. Um, we've heard a lot about the research that was done on prisoners. There's now um, a big movement to sort of say, well, it's actually harmful, potentially, to prisoners not to give them access um, uh, to research in certain, in certain settings. 
So, um, is there anything we can learn from the past that might be helpful um, in investigating some of these questions? Um, there is, I can tell you, if you're not aware of it, um, I think um, pressure always um, within the medical scientific community um, um, to permit more research um, and perhaps to relax the consent constriction. Uh, restrictions in some ways. Um, and there are prominent ethicists, uh, bioethicists, many who are funded by researchers um, who are busy leading that um, effort. And sometimes it's said to be for the common good. Sometimes in, this, uh, in the case of prisoners, the suggestion is it might be for the good of the um, individual and we shouldn't treat them paternalistically um, as, um, as, in fact, vulnerable um, subjects. Um, but I think there are some questions that we can raise. Um, some of the proponents for this suggest that um, uh, consent is always sufficient as a safeguard. And I think we heard some questions about uh, whether that's uh, true or not from Professor Block. Um, um, can consent be manipulated? Um, and how um, is that possible? What do we do in terms of um, the incentives that we give to, um, uh, to, to research subjects? Um, um, are there risks? Um, that no one should be allowed to undertake even if they voluntarily consent for it. And that's, again, part of what I think um, Professor Block was suggesting, um, that there are ways of treating people in which we might not even allow them to voluntarily say they should be treated. Um, um, questions about what it means to be vulnerable, um, what it means to be exploited, I think are uh, continuing to be questions that we need to ask today. And reflecting on the history of what happened in the middle of the last century, um, I think can help us. Second issue, um, biomedical research ethics. Um, and I'm just going to give you one example, because it's been a prominent one in all of the research that we've um, talked about, um, is um, human challenge trials. Um, much of what you heard about, certainly from the, um, in the last presentation about uh, the Japanese experiments, um, much of what was done um, um, in, uh, by the uh, Nazi uh, physicians was deliberately infecting um, uh, persons in order to do research on infectious diseases. Um, from the Nuremberg Code, uh, Nuremberg trials, um, if people in general know anything about them, they know about the uh, hypothermia experiments and the high altitude experiments. And certainly, um, uh, for many years, those are the only things that I really uh, knew about. Um, but uh, as you heard a little bit, um, there were um, deliberate um, um, infection challenge experiments with Clostridia streptococci, um, and even to the point of uh, imitating uh, the wounds that would be uh, um, incurred in warfare, glass shards were put into the wounds um, where the, in, uh, the inoculum had occurred so that it could um, imitate the effect of shrapnel um, on, the, uh, on the infections. And this was done to test whether um, sulfa uh, would uh, work or not um, for these infections. Um, um, but these challenge experiments didn't go very far um, in the um, in the in the in the trial, um, and that's why they concentrated on some of the other experiments. And why was that? Because the United States had been involved um, in uh, challenge trials um, as well. Um, and this is part of what you heard about um, um, IV um, uh, uh, prevaricating uh, uh, about, um, um, that we were testing mostly it was not um, uh, for um, uh, war in directly about um, infections that would be incurred in warfare. Um, but there was a great concern during the war to get soldiers back um, into, the, into fighting condition if they had venereal diseases while they were out on leave. Um, and there was also a public health war on sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so that gonorrhea uh, was, um, uh, was purposefully um, in, uh, um, applied to the genitalia of prisoners in Terre Haute. Um, um, uh, syphilis and gonorrhea, um, and this is what got me, I have to say, into the whole um, uh, er era of uh, studying um, medicine in the Holocaust, is that I was on uh, Obama's Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, and one of the things that we were asked to investigate were the experiments that were done in secret by the United States government um, in Guatemala immediately after the Second World 
World War, in which we were purposefully infecting uh, uh, Guatemalan prisoners, psychiatric patients, and soldier, soldiers with syphilis and gonorrhea to see if uh, penicillin would work, our drug, instead of um, uh, sulfa. Um, and we were doing this while the Nuremberg trials were being conducted, <laughs> while they were being conducted. Um, and um, it seemed unimaginable to me, um, and that's what got me to reading the indictments um, 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 for the first time and recognizing um, uh, the uh, role of, uh, of uh, Nazi experiments in, uh, in human challenge trials as well. Uh, we did work on uh, malaria, having people be um, in, a, in the Stateville, Illinois penitentiary, uh, purposefully bitten by um, uh, mosquitoes bearing malaria. Um, and um, children uh, who were, uh, had intellectual developmental disability um, at Willowbrook in, uh, in New York were purposefully infected with hepatitis um, up until 1970. Um, for um, experiments that were being done in the United States. Um, so um, I think Roberto again had asked, were there defenses? Um, 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 one of the ones you may have uh, heard um, subsequently um, that was mounted by the uh, defense uh, attorneys at Nuremberg was, we're not the only people doing this. Um, and it's still happening. Um, so um, I don't know if, how many of you are aware uh, that, that um, shortly after uh, the SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or uh, COVID um, pandemic began, um, uh, experiments were initiated in the United Kingdom to purposefully infect volunteers with COVID. Uh, um, I don't know how many of you would sign up for such an, uh, such an experiment. This is before any treatment, before any vaccines, in order to sort of facilitate um, the, uh, the development of, vac uh, of vaccines. Um, um, uh, so, um, um, is there anything we can uh, learn from the past? Um, um, I don't think that challenge experiments, um, and if you want to read my article, you can uh, look at that, are absolutely um, um, off the table. I think there are ways in which they can be done um, safely and non-exploitively, but um, um, uh, what's the magnitude of public need that would justify taking any risk of that magnitude at all? Um, again, is consent enough. Simply because somebody says they want to um, do this voluntarily and sign the piece of paper, um, uh, is, it, um, uh, is it sufficient to allow them to do it? Particularly if uh, the subjects wind up actually being paid a fair amount to do this, um, and they might be people um, who, for um, uh, uh, socioeconomic reasons um, and, um, um, and, uh, and other social reasons, might need uh, the money. Um, and then uh, what level of risk to the subjects would be too great um, uh, to permit such, uh, such experiments. Again, not ruling them out completely, but can we learn from the history in which this was the main kind of experiment that was being uh, done, or one of the major uh, realms of, of research um, uh, um, for, the f for the future if we are to conduct, continue to conduct uh, human challenge experiments? Population health um, is another theme that's become very uh, uh, common in our uh, contemporary discourse about medicine. Um, um, but in some ways, you can think of a lot of Nazi medicine as um, pure population health, right? Um, they emphasize the collective over the individual. The patient, as you've heard from others, became the folks corpor. Um, um, and in many ways, and uh, Warren Reich from the uh, uh, Kennedy Institute in the, in, in the past has looked at the ways in which there's a certain elision between um, the word Vorsorgen, which is um, prevention, um, uh, emph being emphasized over Fürsorgen, which is care. Um, and um, this was um, a, a part of the, um, the, the sort of um, uh, leadership school um, mentality that was being um, employed for um, training um, uh, German physicians as to what their role was in society. Um, and you've um, heard a bit of 
about this. This is actually my copy. I got so there. Many of them were apparently destroyed by the Soviets um, when they um, uh, came in, but there are still um, extant copies. This is a second edition of uh, Rahm's uh, textbook, Arztliche Rex und Standeskunde, um, uh, and. Um, uh, as you've heard from others, the, the Nazis were the first government in the world to require the teaching of uh, ethics um, in medical school. Um, and um, so it wasn't just the science that they were being, uh, being taught, but they were also being taught ethics, um, but a peculiar, peculiar kind of ethics. Um, so here's what population health meant, according to Rahm. Um, um, uh, the physician has a duty to reshape the attitude uh, of a right to one's body that comes out of crass individualism into a moral duty for health. Um, now, there are some things about that that I think most of us would think um, probably are right if we want to criticize some abuses within the United States. But again, as a word of caution, um, where do we take that? Is there anything we can learn from the past about the way in which we might um, practice population health? Um, um, how might the history that we've heard about over the last um, uh, day and a half um, inform our own new emphasis on population health? What's the appropriate relationship between the individual patient good and the common good? And how do we guarantee that that's going to happen? Um, again, you um, heard um, uh, um, something about how the Soviets um, interpreted um, uh, that, which was very similar um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to the uh, Nazi uh, way of thinking about it. Um, that's certainly not the way in which we um, are intending to go um, uh, currently. But what do we need to guard against? Um, uh, what's the appropriate um, relationship between the uh, individual patient's good and the common good? What's the role of the state in making that determination? How much of it ought to come from medicine? How much of it ought to come from our culture? If we go back to um, uh, uh, Shelley Rubenfeld's um, uh, opening remarks this morning, um, where does that get determined between the profession, um, the institutions of our culture, um, and the state? Um, and how is that adjudicated? Um, what level of public health um, requires, um, uh, is required, a public health threat is required uh, before we um, uh, justify coercive uh, measures. Um, certainly, we can, um, um, I think, all agree that if somebody has multi-drug resistant tuberculosis um, and they are refusing to take their medications, that the state is justified um, in moving in on that person. But, um, you know, where's the line short of that? Um, and, uh, and how do we justify that? Um, what's the line between persuasion and manipulation in our public health messaging? Um, and how do we do that? And do we tolerate um, sometimes little white lies in order to achieve uh, a better good? And if we do that, um, are we um, endangering uh, our own internal uh, ethics as um, healthcare professionals? Um, um, and you may be aware that now people are talking about nudges um, to sort of help people think about what the right thing is to do um, in terms of um, uh, appropriate public health, um, health behaviors. And where is the line between nudging and manipulating and um, the line between educating and, uh, and nudging. Eugenics, um, obviously worth a whole uh, lecture series um, and many, many books. Um, um, it's, uh, but it was, as you've heard before, an international movement that preceded the Nazis. Um, widespread, but particularly the US, the UK, and Germany were really the leaders in this movement. It led to involuntary sterilization programs, particularly um, um, in the US. Um, and when the Germans started um, um, reacting to that and ramping it up uh, as quickly uh, as, they, as they did, and as uh, Professor Rubenfeld uh, spoke to you ab about it, there was a, um, a, a director of a hospital um, for um, uh, the um, intellectually disabled in Virginia um, who said the Germans are beating us at our own game. Um, and you can read reports of the sterilization program that were published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, that were not critical um, at all of this um, uh, uh, 
program of sterilization. Um, it was embraced by German physicians, by the Nazi party, and then especially, as we've heard, um, by Nazi physicians. Um, and it also, um, sadly, um, gave a, cru uh, a, a sort of scientific veneer um, to crude uh, Nazi anti-Semitism. So again, um, I'll remind you that this is from an, a textbook of, quote, ethics, uh, Rudolf Rahm's Archlicher Rex und Standeskunde. And um, uh, I apologize if some of this is as crude um, as it is. I, uh, I th um, thought to myself, um, it's almost going to be like reading pornography to you. But I think we have to confront uh, the, the gravity of what was being said. Um, on page 118, um, the marriage health law uh, serves on the one hand to prohibit the coupling of sick, inferior, or endangered genes to superior ones, and on the other hand promotes the correct choice of spouse for the German people through marriage counseling and genetic biological principles. This was ethics, right? So um, it's an, always an, a warning to all of us that um, just because someone is an ethicist, it's an argument from authority. Um, you believe their arguments, don't believe them just because of the position that they hold. Um, because some, being an ethicist doesn't make you actually ethically correct um, in your analysis. And on page 119, and again, um, it's almost too disgusting, um, but I will um, uh, read it aloud. Um, um, the laws aimed at forcing back and excluding Judah um, have found great resonance and partial imitation in many European states, especially in those like Germany, which were brought to the brink of the abyss by the Jew. Um, so this is ethics. It's racialized um, 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 uh, uh, into the textbook that's being taught um, to, um, uh, to the uh, German medical students. And then in the following pages, the um, law for the prevention of genetically ill offspring was placed in force uh, on 1-1-1934, 1 1 and it provided for the sterilization of the bearers of certain genetic sicknesses, but only after prior hereditary court uh, proceedings. Really very slick, right? So we've got these courts that will say whether this is um, uh, um, uh, okay or not. So it's got, uh, again, um, the veneer of being something that is official and supervised. Um, but the genetic sicknesses which fall under this law are those born mentally deficient, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, hereditary falling sickness, Huntington's chorea, uh, hereditary blindness, hereditary deafness, extreme hereditary physical deformity. Further, one who suffers from extreme alcoholism can be sterilized. Um, um, all in the name of um, a form, um, a horrendous form of, um, uh, of, of, of eugenics. But meanwhile, in the U.S., while we're busy saying this is horrible, um, uh, this, um, or this can't happen again, um, or that's not us, we're not Nazis, um, again, we had in 1927 the famous quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Um, and um, this persisted for a long time in the United States. Oregon changed its, the name of its sterilization program from the Board of Eugenics, which it was in the early 20th century, to the Board of Social Protection um, um, in the 1960s, and they only closed it down in 1983. Um, um, s stunning um, uh, to learn. Um, I graduated from medical school in 1982. It was still apparently going on. So, uh, again, seems horrendous. Um, is there um, um, uh, um, anything we can uh, learn today? Well, today, um, I think you know there isn't any um, overt um, uh, racism or anti-Semitism to the certainly to the extreme that we read in uh, Rahm's textbook um, in our public discourse about eugenics. Um, and we really have all but stopped involuntary sterilization. Um, but eugenics persists um, in our discourse. Um, there are attempts to eliminate uh, genetic uh, disorders um, and some backlash from the disability community about um, um, some, of, uh, some of that. Um, gene selection for desirable traits. Um, so when people are doing in vitro uh, fertilization, there's often a selection. Uh, there are advertisements for people who um, want um, um, uh, uh, 
gametes that are um, uh, um, associated with um, intelligence and um, certain colors of eyes and um, athleticism, etc. Um, there are calls for genetic enhancement um, through, uh, uh, through CRISPR, um, that we might be able to not only fix diseases, but actually move into enhancement, and even calls for transhumanism, that we can make ourselves better um, by becoming something that's more than, uh, more than human. So, as we confront those questions, is there anything we can learn um, from the past, or is it just so foreign to us that we can't? Um, uh, well, I think we have done a lot to stop coercive uh, eugenics, um, but are there limits to individual eugenic choices? Um, could we think about those? Um, or is it simply by recognizing purely the autonomy of every individual to um, uh, do what, um, uh, um, have complete um, uh, genetic uh, freedom? Um, does positive eugenics um, potentially result in unfair advantages so that the wealthy and uh, the, um, the already well-off and educated um, get more resources and the distance between them um, and those who don't have access to the positive eugenics um, get less? Um, um, so are certain eugenic choices unjust in that or other ways? Um, is there covert racism in our autonomous eugenic um, choices um, and do those choices amplify um, systemic racism? Questions that I think we need to confront um, uh, today. And lastly, um, I'll talk about euthanasia, um, which again we also have to recognize was an international movement that preceded national socialism. It was popular with physicians and was undertaken, um, taken up by the Nazis with enthusiasm. Um, but it wasn't as if they invented the idea. Um, uh, again, I had been um, ignorant for, uh, for many years of the fact that the, um, that the phrase uh, Lebens und Wirtens Leben, um, or life unworthy of being lived, um, was not a Nazi creation, um, but dates to uh, 1927 to uh, um, Binding and Hoche, um, and that the movement um, advocated um, not um, uh, both voluntary and involuntary uh, euthanasia. It wasn't just um, a movement to, um, uh, to euthanize those who were, um, uh, uh, who were deficient, um, euthanasia in scare quotes perhaps, um, but also um, for those who were, uh, who were terminally ill. And um, there are um, certainly, many of you are aware, um, Nazi propaganda films that sort of mix those two together um, 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 in, uh, in, in ways that made them, uh, uh, that were um, actually not deceptive in the ways that people were um, thinking about them even from the um, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, again, you've heard before, uh, it had been news to me until maybe ten, uh, five, ten years ago, um, but the gas chamber was not something that was invented by the Gestapo. It was invented by um, physicians uh, carrying out their euthanasia program, um, and, um, um, and um, particularly in psychiatric um, hospitals. Um, again, back to our textbook. Um, and uh, Ram, um, um, what does he say about uh, euthanasia? Um, it is the task of the physician to be pioneering, Wegbereiter, um, uh, um, in regard to these ideas. It's the task of the state to give it the force of law. Um, so again, um, uh, to some of the comments that have said this was an ideal, uh, I, I, I Idealism or ideal or ideology that was forced upon um, um, physicians. Um, um, I think the, the historical record um, would suggest otherwise, that there were people who were plenty eager um, to have um, this sort of program um, um, endorsed by uh, the National Socialist uh, uh, program um, so that they could be pioneers and the state could simply um, permit them to do what they thought was the right thing to do from uh, a eugenic and biological and medical perspective. Um, you've heard about Irmfried uh, Eberl, a psychiatrist, uh, joined the party as a medical student, a medical director of the T4 program at, uh, at Bernberg. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, Shelley already uh, showed uh, this slide. Um, I'll just give you a personal reflection um, that 
before I visited um, uh, uh, Bernberg, you know, um, um, I hadn't known um, uh, about the gas chambers there or how um, the T4 program had been uh, enacted. Um, I was shocked to know that the hospital there before, during, and after the war, up to the present day, is still treating psychiatric patients. So upstairs, people are being given Prozac and group therapy, and in the basement is still the gas chamber that was used uh, during the T4, uh, T4 program. Um, I had been um, to, uh, um, to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, I had been to Theresienstadt. I had been to Sachsenhausen. Um, but nothing for me as a physician was more chilling than to see the gas chamber in the hospital itself, um, in the hospital itself. And what's the connection? Again, you heard it, but I'll emphasize it again, uh, between uh, medicine and the final solution. Uh, the uniquely Nazi program is that they began to ask themselves in the concentration camps, um, how do we kill a lot of people um, um, quietly and efficiently? Who knows how to do that? And the answer was our doctors. Um, and that's why um, uh, Eberl uh, was sent to Treblinka, um, because the doctors knew how to kill people. Now, again, we can say, oh, you know, the euthanasia today has nothing to do with that. Um, or um, uh, that was so terrible, um, we have to distance ourselves from it um, uh, completely, but it's, um, um, it's something we can't learn anything from. Um, and anybody who says anything in relationship to the two is um, thinking analogically. I don't want to think analogically about this. I want to think in terms of um, attitudes, cultural ideals, um, um, et cetera, um, that might help us to learn from what, what went awry um, in, uh, in Germany to our own attitudes at, at, at today. Um, we certainly know that voluntary euthanasia is gaining acceptance in the West. Um, the numbers are increasing um, um, in some places like Canada, increasing at a very rapid pace. Um, if you uh, think about the Netherlands right now, 5% of all uh, deaths are by uh, euthanasia. There's another 18% uh, that are not called euthanasia, but they're um, called um, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of double uh, uh, a uh, palliative sedation in which the person is simply given higher and higher doses of drugs until they are dead. So it's a large portion the population that's actually um, dying um, from, uh, from euthanasia. Um, it's increasing in scope um, in um, many other countries, in infants, the psychiatrically ill, um, and the demented. So is there anything we can learn um, from the past that will help us in reflecting um, on uh, euthanasia today? Um, are these expansions in scope? Um, um, actually signs of moral progress, that we're allowing more and more people access um, to a needed beneficial um, uh, treatment when they are at the end of life? Um, or is it a slippery slope um, in, um, uh, in a um, serious uh, moral way? Um, does euthanasia really have a place uh, in the physician-patient um, relationship? Um, when we think about um, where, what, it, what its past has been, um, does this say anything about our society and its values that we're moving in this direction? I mean, we are able now to do more than we have ever been able to do in the history of humankind in terms of palliative care for persons who um, are um, at the end of their lives. Um, what does it say that this is the moment in history at which we're saying um, that's not enough for us, um, we need to have access to um, uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide? Um, and are the concerns that are raised by the disabled community about this um, and the threat that they see in it um, justified? So, um, obviously a glittering um, view, more questions than, uh, than answers. Um, um, I would say that um, studying this history is not going to solve our problems uh, directly, um, but I hope you'll agree that ignoring the history that we've learned over the past um, uh, day and a half uh, might only deepen uh, our problems, that we need to somehow incorporate uh, that history, learn from it, reflect on it, and have it um, inform our deliberations today. Um, 
uh, I think we need to avoid uh, taking um, uh, pride in saying, well, we're not like them. Um, that's a pretty low bar, right? Uh, a pretty low bar. <laughs> um, uh, I think we need to strive constantly uh, to preserve um, some sort of authentic um, uh, 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 medical ethics and maybe recovery so recover something of our uh, of our history um, from the first past 2,500 years or even uh, earlier. Um, there are Chinese um, medical oaths. There are um, uh, Indian uh, medical oaths the, um, that go back even before Hippocrates. Um, and there are similarities to many of these um, that um, uh, I think contain ancient wisdom that we uh, dismiss um, um, at, our, uh, at our peril. Um, so we have to find out how to connect that, um, that history to the present day and not throw it out. Because if you read Rahm's textbook, um, the first part is a history, much of which is about discarding uh, Hippocratic, um, uh, Jewish, and Christian um, attitudes about ethics as being too soft or irrelevant to the uh, to the present situation. Um, so um, um, I think we should be vigilant not to fall into traps like that um, and continue um, our uh, our conversation. So um, that's the end of my um, formal remarks. I'll have a few thank you notes and, uh, and such in the end. We do have a little time for, um, for some questions if you want to turn the lights back on. And uh, thank you. Comments, questions, concerns, or too tired at the end of the day, or um, um, you, you need to uh, get, uh, uh, get out of here before sundown. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dan. I think you wrapped up very beautifully the, the kind of questions uh, the previous presentations had uh, raised and in part solved. I just have one, uh, one consideration, which has to do with the fact <clears throat> that whereas in the case of Nazi and perhaps even Japanese experimentation, uh, the driving force was a kind of uh, state totalitarianism, controlling the choices of individuals. Nowadays, we uh, are dealing with the exactly opposite ideology potentially conducing to some of these results, and that is an ideology of uh, expressive individualism, mm -hmm. uh, which I think affects very much all the areas that you have been touching upon, um, certainly the area of eugenics, but also in, uh, in, with respect to the question of, uh, uh, of euthanasia. So the ideology of expressive individualism with the kind of neoliberal model that somehow shapes it, is the danger for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's perhaps no longer the uh, danger of a kind of totalitarian statalism as we had in Germany, but I think uh, this particular ideology is equally, equally problematic. Yes. Uh, yeah, a terrific uh, comment. Um, uh, I'll um, plug uh, the book that um, uh, Shelley and I um, uh, co-edited um, on uh, uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide before, uh, during, and after the Holocaust. And my my own chapter in there was a, ref a reflection on sort of what unites, in some ways, both of those poles, right? Um, um, and and my view is that the central issue actually is control. Um, that the sort of driving force of much of Western science has been control over nature, um, right? Um, um, and that moves in medical science to control over our bodies, right? Um, and then the issue becomes who controls um, the, uh, the body, um, and the body gets controlled um, either by um, the patient with the uh, aid of the doctor 
or by the state with the aid of the doctor, right? um, in those two different ways. But the issue becomes um, that, that unites both of them in many ways is one of, uh, of control. And, sci and, and Western science has pushed since Bacon right, in this kind of, um, uh, 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 kind of direction. Um, so, um, uh, and and one, of the, uh, one of the issues about control um, that becomes very complicated um, is that um, given the fact that we are actually social beings, um, to be in control of your own body actually requires <laughs> you at some level to have some level of control over other people, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's part of why um, there's an urge for perhaps for state sanctioning of some of, uh, some of uh, this um, in, the, in the era of expressive individualism. So, yeah. two questions, yes, plenty, plenty of questions, yes. Thanks, Dan. I, I also thought your uh, uh, summary, more than a summary, your review of the issues uh, uh, was uh, outstanding. Uh, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts about what I'm sure you recognize as a tension between a couple of uh, themes that you touch upon. One is the problem of, uh, uh, as you put it, analogical reasoning. Uh, the other is uh, the uh, kind of reluctance uh, that some might have to learn uh, what is to be learned for the purpose of preventing uh, nightmares uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, probably most of us are familiar with Godwin's uh, Godwin's law, uh, the rule that uh, the longer a discussion over a political disagreement goes on, uh, as, as, as the discussion goes on, the probability of a Nazi analogy approaches one. Uh, <laughs> right, right, uh, right, right, and so, right. so that's, you know, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, right. uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, you, know, it, you know, I, for instance, in, in my own talk, uh, thought it was important to underscore uh, a broader lesson about the humanization that I thought was illustrated with um, unprecedented, unprecedented nightmarishness by the Nazis, but that plays out in a whole variety of other circumstances. Uh, you know, I, there was a, a I, I received a comment an aside afterwards, kind of, you know, suggesting that perhaps, you know, I was doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't ask you to defend me. Uh, but I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how we draw that line uh, between uh, invoking lessons, trying to draw larger lessons, uh, and um, risking uh, uh, being empirical proof of Godwin's law. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, excellent question. And I think I, I'm hopeful that this conference, you know, is sort of part of the forum in which we can begin to do this. And I think that was part of what we did with our own uh, project on uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide, was to try to move beyond the reductio ad Nazi kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, um, argumentation. And then, you know, and then you're, you, know, you, win, you win the argument because you're just like a Nazi, right? I mean, it's just, um, that, that, that's foolish. Um, um, and, and the... Um, and the sort of uh, the, the temptation to reason and um, by analogy um, um, also becomes problematic because then we're trying to make a comparison between something that's happening now and something that happened um, in the past um, in part to part sorts of um, uh, 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 connections in ways that um, then um, lead people to shut down, right, and sort of say, you are accusing me of being um, a Nazi because you've um, uh, in invoked something from the past. So I think um, um, it is to really um, dive more deeply into the history um, and into the history of, uh, uh, history of ideas um, and to look at the, the sort of um, uh, the, the sort of philosophical um, underpinnings um, um, that, um, um, that, that drove a kind of ideology um, uh, that um, went mad, right? Um, uh, from for which we can see a prior um, um, a sort of precursors within um, the within Western and Eastern thought. Um, uh, universal to the human uh, uh, condition, um, and um, and to try to find the um, uh, the, the sort of um, 
guideposts that we can use along the way to sort of say, um, when does this drive for control, for instance, over um, nature serve our needs, um, and when does it become um, a force that needs to be um, tamed? Um, um, to look at political philosophy, again, questions of what's the proper role between profession, um, state, um, and culture, and cultural institutions, the role of the academy, the role of religious uh, religions within, uh, within society, and how do they um, balance out, and, and where do we err when one um, becomes dominant, right? Those kinds of questions, um, I think, are raised by uh, the experience, and to think about them in the, that sort of more analytic way rather than then analogically, um, I think, is the way to sort of move the discussion forward. Um, because otherwise, you're right, um, um, the, uh, the probability um, uh, reaches one not only of uh, the reductio ad nazi, but of people leaving the room uh, being angry and hurt. And that's, no, that's not productive. So, yes. so um, in the United States, uh, both in the Belmont Report and in the Beecham and Childress uh, textbook, um, the, the ethical um, foundation is pretty evenly spread across respect for persons, informed consent, beneficence, and justice. The Nuremberg Code uh, conveys mu a much stronger sort of one note message of consent of the subject, respect for persons. Um, how much does the, how significant is the difference there in trying to decide how to deal with the problems that you identified in your five categories in research ethics, eugenics, uh, euthanasia? Can you, can you comment on, on how, how much does it really matter um, where we start from, sort of at the, at the theoretical level, anyway. Yeah, thanks. A, a great question. Um, I, I think I very much share Professor Block's uh, uh, view that um, consent is not enough. Right? Um, that um, that we really need um, to have a a, a stronger um, a sense. Uh, that's that's even in some ways within our current regulatory structure. I mean, the, the thing that gets ignored by IRBs all the time, for instance, is you know what's the rationale for doing this in the first place? What's the justification for it? Um, and um, you know, um, there there is a sense in which you know. Um, so it's good to have science um, um, be um, driven by its um, uh, you know, own ideals of the unrestricted um, free desire to know, right? Um, um, but that that has to have um, limits. Um, and those limits have to be that there is established um, um, a need for this, um, that, that there is um, a, a proof that it would be sufficiently valuable, that, um, uh, that it's worth the risk, um, and balancing the good that could be accomplished through this against the, uh, against the risks. Second, um, to ask about whether there are risks that, um, that no one um, in, in the sort of primum non nocere, um, or at least do no harm. Uh, Hippocrates obviously didn't say primum non nocere because he wrote in Greek, um, uh, but he, he said um, help or make a habit of two things, to help or at least do no harm, right? Um, um, and, um, and so the, the sort of sense of, you know, um, um, that I think we can um, err too much in sort of saying we, you know, we allow the, you know, the autonomous free subject to give consent that's sufficient. They decide how much risk um, is necessary. Um, I think we need uh, to be more vigilant about how much risk we're, um, you know, permitting people to, to to take on. So I think there are more substantive um, aspects, even to what we um, um, have said, um, and consent is um, uh, in, insufficient. But we need um, uh, sometimes we um, make it seem as if it's one note, um, and and I think that that's problematic. Yes. Um. My name is Dee Herman. I was a hospice chaplain for a decade, and I had a, a number of patients over the years who would say to our hospice team, can't you give me something? I'm so worn out from suffering, blah, blah, And we could not. Mm -hmm. But I remember learning from one of the nurses that she told her patients who asked, if that's how you feel, I can't make it happen any faster, but you can choose to stop eating and drinking. Mm -hmm. And 
just by knowing that they had some semblance of control, they could decide whether they really did want to stop eating and drinking or continue. And um, I didn't have any problem with that approach. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, let me, uh, you raised the question of voluntarily stopping eating and, uh, and, and drinking. Um, and um, certainly persons um, um, who are in the very end stages of almost all chronic diseases get to the point at which they lose their appetite or not um, interested in eating. Um, um, and, um, uh, and, and certainly no one should under those conditions be forced to have a feeding tube. Um, I think they should be offered food under those circumstances, um, um, but it's very understandable and there are good reasons why, you know, you, um, you, know, you, um, you shouldn't keep forcing it uh, down people's throats. On the other hand, um, um, uh, there is something um, um, very human about our caring for uh, uh, for persons, um, and um, I've seen actually the opposite um, side of that, where families have wanted to put in a feeding tube because the person wasn't eating, and what I've suggested that they do um, um, is to um, sit their loved one down at the table with them if it's hospice at home, um, and take a demitasse spoon full of honey and put it under their tongue. <laughs> Right, um, not going to keep them alive any longer, it, but it's going to taste good, right? And it's going to give part of the social fabric um, that connects us uh, us to them, um, and um, and and I think gives the patient the sense that they are still valued as part of the community, um, which is part of what they uh, what they want. And you know, they can refuse it if they um, if they want to, but most. Most under those circumstances don't, because um, in, in some ways, um, um, what um, many people who ask about this uh, fear most um, is that we're going to say yes to their sort of desire to end it more quickly. Um, and um, while it might be the best thing for them um, in the end, um, and we shouldn't push it, um, and this is the hospice philosophy, any uh, longer than it needs to be, um, I think um, we should never have within medicine the attitude um, that the world is better off without them, or that their life um, is not worth living, um, even um, uh, even at the end. Um, and of course, we have the option um, also, um, if if the pain is so great, uh, right, of or other symptoms of giving people um, uh, pain medication or other drugs, even to the point that they lose, uh, lose consciousness. If people's fear is um, that they will, um, uh, you know, have symptoms that will um, be overwhelming for them that we can uh, uh, treat those as well. So I never want to ratify um, the idea that the world is better off with uh, without so, uh, someone, um, but I, I think we should never force persons um, uh, persons to eat. Um, I think the more difficult question um, is the person with early Alzheimer's disease, right? Who says, um, I've just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and the prospect of being a burden on other people or being dependent on others is so grave uh, that I'm going to stop eating and drinking now. Um, um, and that, I think, is a form of suicide. Um, by, um, and our assistance with, uh, with that um, um, is a form of assisted suicide. Um, and it's almost impossible, even if you talk to Tim Quill, and I have, I've debated him on many occasions, um, it's almost impossible for someone actually to do that <laughs> without the assistance of somebody sedating them. Um, um, uh, so that when then we become the assistance in, uh, in, that, uh, in that process. Um, so I don't, I don't want to go in, the, in, that, in that direction. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just uh, noticed that it's true in uh, Europe, especially we still have this uh, type of uh, derivation, like you know, euthanasia on vulnerable, like uh, the Groningen protocol or uh, eugenic uh, for modification of life. And uh, in my teaching experience, uh, I have the possibility to debate with ma many medical students, at, you know, first or second year, that just. Uh, feel the pressure of political and economical um, pressure on this topic, on this medical application. So they suggest that is a right or an ethical application of medicine 
eugenic or euthanasia, for example. And it's difficult to contrast many times because politic, uh, you know, pressure is very high. So as educator, do you think that we have a possibility to avoid this uh, derivation of medical students? Uh, yeah, a great pedagogical uh, question. You know, I, I always say that um, f fond of uh, c quoting from Aristotle, to teach ethics to the youth, they have to be well brought up, right? Um, and if you're brought up, um, as, uh, as sadly many people are now, um, not rebelling against a tradition um, that they inherited, but having no tradition whatsoever, um, it's very difficult to find a starting place for, um, um, for, uh, for ethical discourse. Um, and so um, sometimes it takes shock and that's you know the and maybe starting with the holocaust um and um and nazi medical experiments is the way to sort of shock people into saying this this matters right you shouldn't just sort of say you do your thing and i'll do my thing i'm not in this world to live up to yours and you're not in this world to live up to mine and put it on a you know poster of adolf hitler doesn't work right uh, uh that, that or um, or Eberl, right or any of these other uh, persons so we need um i think to somehow um, uh, shock people into saying ethics matters, right? Um, and it's not simply about, there's a difference between um, respect for autonomy um, and uh, it, in the sense that, that I respect you enough to challenge you in what you're saying um, uh, versus indifference. You do what you want. Uh, uh, that, I think, um, is problematic. And we can help people to understand the difference between those two and sort of shock them into thinking that ethics really matters. Um, 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 so, uh, somehow, um, uh, then we have a chance to sort of um, uh, begin, the, uh, begin the educational uh, uh, process. And, and that's part of why I think programs like this can be, uh, can be very helpful, because a lot of um, uh, you know, medical, uh, it's not in our course here at Georgetown, but I can tell you from other places, a lot of medical ethics courses are you sit in the room and what do you think, what do you think, or what do you feel, what do you feel? Um, and, and if they come to my class, I say, you know, um, I don't care what you feel, I want to know what you think, right? <laughs> right? And, and justify this, uh, uh, this position that you're, uh, that you're holding. So, um, so I think that, that something like this can be helpful in that, in that regard as well. Uh, one comment related to um, really the education and how do we get more people to care about ethics. Um, I have always seen that as kind of an opportunity to like bring it into even something as early as K through 12 where you're not necessarily talking about ethics but you start introducing decision making and just making going in with the assumption that everyone is not brought up the same. Everyone is not entering this world with the same sort of guidance or parental um, parental sort of advisement. So couldn't we really think about how we can make people interested in ethics and then as they go on and choose their, grow up and choose their careers, they'll still have that, um, really the basis of the understanding of different types of ethics and how it will integrate into everyone's really world, right? Whether it be business, business ethics or you take it into any one of the STEM fields that are coming up. Um, because as for the future state, I mean, we can talk about how, how medicine has changed because of the integration of technology. And so I really do see the future as, seeing, as being very interdisciplinary and so that we don't want to be siloed in just clinical ethics, right? We want to look at how this clinical ethics may be integrated into, into other fields and how you can have those overarching discussions in the future. Two, uh, two comments in response to that comment, which I think is a great one. One is I'm 100% with you on starting early, right? Um, that's very valuable. Um, I'll give a, a shout out to um, uh, Laura uh, Bishop here. Among the many things she does at the Kennedy Institute is to help us with our high school programs. I mean, there are a lot of um, high schools that are teaching bioethics because in the end, you know, med medicine affects all of our lives in profound ways that it never did before when we couldn't do anything, right? Now you have to decide whether you're going to go on dialysis or stop dialysis, whether, you know, 
grandma's going to um, um, eat uh, when she's um, at the end stages of her cancer or not, right? These are all decisions that we um, uh, need to uh, uh, need to make, and they affect everybody's uh, everybody's lives. So uh, teaching um, earlier is important. Second, um, the uh, what you're talking about the integration and interdisciplinarity. I'll give a plug for our program that we're starting here on emergent ethics. Um, trying to get connections between uh, the Pellegrino Center and the Kennedy Institute doing two aspects, theoretical and practical, in bioethics, but also with our Center for Envi our Program in Environmental Justice um, and our Center for Digital Ethics. Um, because all of these things in our new world are interconnected problems. And if you want to take COVID as a good example, yeah, it starts as an environmental problem of some kind, right? Um, um, it's got to do with data and how we use surveillance techniques, for instance. Um, um, and it has to do with policy issues in ethics and clinical ethics questions all together, right? Um, just as just one small example of the way in which all of those are connected. So the, uh, the interconnection and interdisciplinarity that you're talking about, I think, is really important for the future of bioethics, the future of, uh, of ethics at the intersection of technology and society in general. So thank you. Um, I know that we're out of, uh, out of time. If I could have the slides on for just uh, one, second, uh, one second again. Um, um, I, um, uh, while we're doing that, I want to thank um, um, our, uh, our captioner, who's been uh, diligently working um, for those who've been uh, tuning in on, uh, on Zoom um, um, and um, probably has very tired uh, fingers by now. Um, so um, also thank our AV uh, uh, personnel who helped us to uh, overcome some very significant glitches uh, earlier um, this, uh, uh, this morning. Um, uh, to uh, uh, to let you know that there is uh, where would I go? Um, uh, where back back got that's it. Good. Thank you again to our uh, funders. I've mentioned um, before. Um, Thank you to our planning committee, to, uh, uh, to Laura, to Roxy, to Michael Goldman, uh, Adi uh, Haramadi, David Miller, Marty Patchell, um, Shelley, uh, and, uh, and Miles, who you've uh, um, uh, seen and heard from as well. A lot of work went into this, particularly because we lost our administrator uh, at the Kennedy Institute, and so all of us had to uh, scramble to do this um, um, on our own without um, that kind of administrative support. Um, thank you um, to our um, Wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, speakers who've really um, made uh, uh, made the conference. To our librarians um, and the students who uh, who helped out, um, um, and to uh, all of you in the uh, in the audience for your outstanding um, questions and your uh, participation. Um, and um, as one last uh, uh, bit uh, here for those, again, can we? Uh, I guess maybe somebody could take the computer around and give people a tour, but um, we're going to do it physically and end the, end the Zoom in a, in a moment. Um, uh, but we are going to uh, gather. And uh, Laura, where is Cade going to meet people at the back of the... Uh, there's Cade. Uh, Cade, would you stand up? Great, great, good, thank you. If you can meet, uh, uh, if you're interested in a tour um, of our bioethics research library and our uh, Campbellman uh, collection in uh, Jewish ethics, which is uh, particularly features Jewish medical ethics um, and Holocaust uh, studies. Cade will lead you up to the Kennedy Institute and you'll have to go around uh, the flooded area. Um, Cade, I hope you know to take them up the, uh, yeah, we had a flood last night. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the plagues we've been dealing with. You'll take them up the, uh, the main elevator rather than the back elevator so we don't have to go through that. Um, so um, thank you to those who've tuned in um, on, on Zoom. Thank you to all of, uh, all of you. I'll, I'll also announce again that next uh, um, next week we hope that we'll have an, a slightly edited version of all of this up on the website um, so that if people want to see uh, two weeks two weeks all right give us two weeks thank you I, I was making too much of a promise two weeks we'll have it up on the uh, the website for people to be able to uh, to tune in and see uh, recordings of it share them with uh, with other people um, thank you um, uh, for your attendance um, and um, uh, um, uh, for those uh, um, who celebrate uh, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.